on this edition of In the Life. The winner of the Charlotte, North Carolina Young Playwrights Festival, veteran Dennis Perone promotes marijuana for medical use, and a firefighter who sparks her own controversy on the job. And it's hard to get pregnant. Plus new parents like out and outspoken <laughs> advice columnist Dan Savage. These and other stories on In the Life, America's lesbian and gay cultural news magazine. Swing. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by Michael A. Leppin, the Gill Foundation, the Rainbow Foundation, the Adolph and Ruth Schnurmacher Foundation, the Mitchell Gold Company, in the hopes of eliminating all types of fear and prejudice, and the annual support of In the Life members like you. Welcome to In the Life. Hi, I'm Katherine Linton. As the gay community enters a time of great change, both in how we see ourselves and how society perceives us, we'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to a number of individuals, gay, lesbian, and straight, who are all themselves in the midst of change and in the process challenging some very powerful institutions. Whether it's about medical treatment or the treatment of art, in the workplace or in places of worship, these individuals are working to transform traditional institutions in order to open many more doors to the gay community. In one segment, correspondent Jonathan Capehart explores the controversial campaign to legalize marijuana for medical use and profiles one of the leading proponents, activist Dennis Perone. And we'll visit two couples for whom life is a family affair, as correspondent Andy Hum reports on the growing number of gay men and lesbians intent on having or adopting kids. But first, the story about a gutsy 17-year-old whose play caused an uproar in her own hometown. The young woman soon found herself in the company of another well-known gay playwright by the name of Oscar Wilde, who over a hundred years ago found himself battling the forces of censorship. So while controversy over art and homosexuality continues to this day, what has changed is the rapid response and total support of other gay and lesbian artists including In the Life's own correspondent and writer herself, Tanya Barfield. Samantha Geller is a teenager and aspiring playwright from Charlotte, North Carolina, who recently wrote a one-act play called Life versus the Paperback Romance. The play is about um, a blind woman and a woman who writes paperback romances, and they fall in love. Samantha submitted her play to the Charlotte Young Playwrights Festival and was chosen as one of the five winners. But her play was the only one that was not produced. The subject matter was considered inappropriate for a junior high and high school audience. And I thought that was bullcrap because, I mean, when I was in middle school, I was already questioning and I don't see where it could be unacceptable. I read the play. I'm reading the play. I'm looking for it. Where's the anal sex? Where's the violence? Where's the stuff that I could get really upset about? And I read this marvelous, gentle evocation of two women characters who feel real to me. I'm a fan of the hourglass shape. Hourglass? It's like out and in and out. <laughs> show me. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea how to show you. <laughs> Do you have an hourglass? Well, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> then how the hell am I gonna figure it out? couldn't pick a more benign lesbian play to get by in North Carolina. What is wrong with you people? 
I think I first read about what happened to Sam in the New York Times, actually. Holly Hughes is a performance artist who knows about censorship. In 1990, she was one of four artists targeted under a congressional statute on indecency. As a result, their grants from the National Endowment for the Arts were rescinded. Some people called us the NEA4. Other people referred to us as Karen Finley and the three homosexuals. <laughs> if there's anything that's less fundable than, than queer theater, it's got to be queer youth work. Hughes organized a reading of Samantha's play at the Public Theater in New York City to raise money for gay youth organizations. The night before, Samantha and veteran writer Dorothy Allison read from their work at Blue Stockings, a woman's bookstore in New York's Lower East Side. Now, how do we want to do this? It's, it's really exciting. I've never done a reading at a bookstore before. I've never attended one. I'm just shaking with excitement. Getting to read with one of the best authors of our time, Dorothy Allison. Allison, National Book Award finalist and author of Bastard Out of Carolina, had come to New York to help publicize the issue. When I was 17, um, I didn't know any out gay people at all. First of all, I want to say how glad I am to be here with Sam. I said, okay, I will come and help you do pre-publicity because I've been in this position. You know, I've been going along, doing my work, getting published, and had somebody slap me in my face and say, what the hell do you think you're doing? You're a dyke, which is exactly what happens. And then you feel like somebody has grabbed you, pulled the ground out from under you, and told you that the thing you want most to do in the world, you really can't and aren't allowed to do. And the guy called up and he said, you just won. You get $100. I was like, woo! <laughs> and he's like, that was what was surprising, that she won an award. You know, he's like, you're one of five top writers. Your play will not be performed on stage. Because usually queer material, particularly in a children's playwright contest, would have just been censored. And you have three choices. One, you can rewrite your play without the lesbians. <laughs> and actually it was Samantha who decided she wasn't going to take this. In fact, other plays with gay content had won in the past, but the artists had always agreed to edit out the content. One last question. What is your best hope of what is going to come out of your coming to New York and the production of the reading at the public? That it will be seen by middle and high school audiences in Charlotte, North Carolina. <laughs> The fact that any of this is happening, the fact that the reading's happening is just so amazing to me. And now I'm meeting the people that I just wish I could even come close to when I was a kid. Good evening, welcome, we're so glad you're here. Uh, I am Kate Clinton and this evening I'm going to be your MC, your docent, the dominatrix for the evening. I didn't think it was going to be as as big an undertaking as it started out to be. This is how lesbian organizing happens. And she says, well, if I get a certain number of names who will agree to come and do this thing, then we can get a theater. Please welcome, hold on, Leah Delaria. Dear Samantha, thank you for providing what the dramaturgs like to call the inciting event for tonight's extraordinary celebration. Gay and lesbian artists, including myself, came to the public theater to support Samantha and to speak out against censorship. When I started working on this and I started thinking, oh, I could get really great statements from queer artists who'd been censored, I realized that was all queer artists. Look around you. Take these men and women in. These are the people fighting the good fight for people like you and me. I'm very clear that this would not have happened as well or as quickly or with as much success if some of us didn't have the kind of power that we've established. The opportunity to do something for a young queer kid was great. So thank you all for coming tonight. Please welcome to the stage Mary Louise Parker, Lisa Crone, and Tanya Barfield. I like you. I love you. You're the most amazing person I've ever met. And I want to love with you 
forever. I wanted to tell you this, but I was scared. You might not have wanted me. Given that, that we don't necessarily have to be the same kind of people all the time, or even agree, when we are attacked, we bond and fight back. That's a wonderful thing. Since the publication of my novels, I have received letters from students concerned about the omission of gay and lesbian books from their school libraries. This censorship is due to pressure from conservative groups and some parents. Many schools have pulled books with information about homosexuality from gay role models to HIV prevention from their library shelves. This kind of censorship can further isolate gay and lesbian youth who, according to studies, are three times more likely to commit suicide than straight teens. For a list of websites that offer information and resources for gay and lesbian youth, visit In the Life's website at www.inthelifetv.org. I'm Scott Heim, and you're watching In the Life. As coming out in the workplace becomes more and more common, gays and lesbians continue to break down stereotypes about sexual orientation. Next, you'll meet a woman who also contradicts several stereotypes about gender. Not only is Michelle Kammerer a woman firefighter, she is also a fire chief, second in command at company number 63 in Venice, California. Over the years, she has climbed to the top of her profession, all while undergoing some major changes. Most people today, because of the way society is, will look at she's a female captain before they'll look at her skills. I've been a firefighter for 27 years. It's been my uh, life for a long time. I've been a captain since 1978. First line supervisor on an engine company, fighting fire with my crew. And I'm the uh, captain on engine 63. Being in a fire, inside of a building on fire, or at a brush fire with, with a lot of exciting fire and activity, it's, it's adrenaline producing and it's great. And I've, you know, I've paid the price too. I have a permanent lung damage. I have a uh, herniated disc. I have had, I've been burned. I've had ceilings fall on me. I've uh, broken my wrist. Um, it's a dangerous job. We are looked at many times in the public, uh, basically male, uh, big, strong, and um, masculine, I think, is our image. Well, women in the fire service is a fairly new phenomenon. And, um, the fire service, uh, just as the fire service resisted, you know, uh, Afro-American people, they've really resisted women in the fire service. They don't have trouble working with her. Um, they have difficulties in understanding her. There wasn't a letter that came in that said, you know, hey, Michelle Kamer is a lesbian on the fire department or anything like that. Being a gay or lesbian has been such a um, closeted thing for so many years. Uh, it's su such an unknown and queer and weird thing that uh, there's a lot of fear around that. If she had come to me and basically tried to shove her lesbianism down my throat or, or demand some type of different treatment because she is a lesbian, then I'd have probably had a problem with it. Does it is it threatening because their own uh, masculinity or their own femininity is, is threatened? Yeah. Is, is it because People in super macho occupations have very fragile masculinities in the first place. The, the men feel, and women here feel very stressed out having gay and lesbian uh, captain and gay and lesbian living. You have to realize this is not just a job. We live, sleep, shower, eat together, change together. So it's not just a job. We live together 10 days a month yeah. our whole lives. Uh -huh. They're forced to live with a lesbian, yes. 
and it doesn't rub off. That was part of part of the reaction, you know, it seems to me that some of the fear about being around gay and lesbian people. But they respect her as a good firefighter and a great captain. So there's tolerance and respect, but there's definitely no support for her here. It's hard for her. There was people that refused to work overtime uh, uh, on my shift because I was there and weird or whatever. So the women's locker room is a fairly new thing here. We have three women working here, myself and two other paramedic women. And so we have a temporary sign saying women's locker room and then somebody put up this sign that says female and male, occupied, unoccupied. But I hate this sign because if it's, it's redundant. And then somebody put a screw in here so you can't change it. So it's always female, occupied or unoccupied. It's so bizarre. Have a nice day. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, I used to work with Tom's brother. Tom's brother was a paramedic here when I was uh, a male fire captain. So this is my second time here as a captain. Uh, and uh, first time as a male, second time as a woman. <laughs> it is kind of shocking and confusing for people that, you know, here, um, uh, I was a heterosexual man, man and now I'm a, a woman and still chasing women that, you know, huh, where's that come from? So that's confusing to people. They can't separate sexual orientation from sexual identity. It's, they're two separate things. So my sexual orientation really didn't change. It's my sex that changed. So my interest in my, in my, in my attraction is to women and always has been. They do not understand how she could be a lesbian. Having changed her, her uh, physical being into a female and still um, having a desire sexually towards female. This drawer reminds me of my life. It's quite cluttered. So tell us about your life. My life. Oh, wow. My life, my life. I had a very problematic childhood because my gender identity from as early as I can remember has been girl, woman, female. And I was uh, born uh, with male genitalia and I was a normal male a baby and child and so I was extremely confused. Um, fearing uh, embarrassment, shame and being beaten I didn't uh, you know I couldn't express myself or ask my, ask my parents or my mother to dress me up as a girl because that's what I thought I should be or who I was. So I kept it all inside for many years and, and I secretly cross-dressed. I felt certain as I, as I grew up that it was uh, a woman, as a woman. I am a woman. In the meantime, I got on. I was in the Navy, and I uh, married a sweetheart from high school. We had two kids, and then I decided to keep exploring myself and growing and trying to figure out who I am. And when I came out of the closet and became a woman full time, I was in a little fire station uh, not far from here with a crew of three people underneath me. It was very difficult for them. And, and it's very difficult for a lot of people to make that switch. <sighs> it's been hard, no, it hasn't been hard at all. She's just, you know, it's just another person to work with as far as I'm concerned. Um, comfortable, it's just um, so, like something I've, that most people don't come across in their day-to-day -day life, you know, so it's a little different. We had a person the other day that could not work with her, he had some uh, real psychological hang-ups in just being around her, uh, just because he knew her when she was a man, and he couldn't handle it, so he had to go home. And I've had to deal with those old feelings of sharing a locker room with a man I've known for 15 years that changed into a woman, and now she has feelings for a woman, and yet I'm changing in a locker room with her. I had to deal with those feelings. I think being a lesbian was in my favor because I was far less threatening than, than if I had transitioned and become a woman and then suddenly was interested in dating men. I think the firefighters would be would have been a lot more uncomfortable because of the homophobia and the fact that they may have thought that you know I would you know be scamming and trying to pick up men. 
often I've tried to be as accommodating as possible and uh, sometimes I will get my bedding and I will put it on the floor in like the workout room or the weight room and sleep in there. Be anyway, that's what I've done and that's an alarm coming in. It seems to me I was very successful in my transition uh, from male to female because I had such a good um, reputation, you know, as a, as a strong worker and a productive firefighter. She sheds a good light on gay and lesbian in the workplace because she's positive, energetic, very professional, hardworking, devoted. And so it makes it a heck of a lot easier than to somebody who might have been um, not the caliber that Kevin Cameron is. My new play, Another American, Asking and Telling, is based on more than 150 interviews conducted all over the country with straight, gay, lesbian, and bisexual military personnel. Like Michelle Kammerer, the service members I interviewed are professional, hardworking, and devoted to their jobs. However, because of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, gay and lesbian service members are forced to conceal their sexuality or risk losing their careers. To find out more about these issues as explored in the new group's production of my play, visit In the Life's website at www.inthelifetv.org. I'm Mark Wolf, and you're watching In the Life. One of the most controversial facets of this country's war on drugs has been the use of marijuana for medical purposes. California's Proposition 215, passed in 1996, legalizes its use as a painkiller by a patient or caregiver. Perhaps the most outspoken advocate for medical marijuana and the person behind Proposition 215 is a Bay Area gay man and AIDS activist. The cannabis farm in Northern California is a place where people can grow marijuana legally for their own medical use with the sanction of their doctor. The pioneering advocate for the legalization of medical marijuana and founder of the farm is an HIV-positive Vietnam veteran named Dennis Perrone. My name is Dennis Perrone, and I have a lot of titles. I'm the founder of the Cannabis Buyers Club. I'm the author of Prop 215. I'm an ex-candidate for governor, and now I am the founder of the cannabis farm. So I got a lot of titles. What do I do? I'm a farmer. We found this farm from one of our members of the club who had cancer, who has since died. Uh, but he has a dream that uh, someday marijuana would be grown here. Mm -hmm. And he uh, rented it to the club. And now it is a co-op of people from the club, uh, essentially people who have recommendations from their doctor, who have AIDS, cancer, MS. It's a loose co-op of about 20 people who got it together, cultivated this marijuana, and now are going to share in it together. Taking off all the uh, water leaves, which we'll use for baking later on, and uh, just trimming up all the leaves and the stems to where we have just, just the beautiful bud left. You want my impression of the farm? Yeah. It's a real haven, and it's a place for people to get healed. The marijuana takes away the pain of the arthritis, which I have in my neck and in my shoulders. And it takes away the pain in my legs. I have neuropathy in my legs, and sometimes they're painful. My feet hurt. It really takes away the pain. Well, it helps me eat. It helps me uh, take my pills. I wouldn't even begin to try the pills without it. Uh, I don't have any appetite without it. Um, so I eat and stay healthy and stay taking my pills. And I've been getting healthier and healthier and healthier. We have known for a long time that marijuana increases the appetite. How that works is unclear. Whether or not it enhances the sensory appeal of food, uh, collapses the so-called satiety mechanism, which tells us when we're full, or enhances the hunger mechanism, it's unclear. There's not anything, any pharmaceutical out there that causes hunger. I mean, you can do as much research as you want. There is nothing on the market that will actually make you hungry. Marinol is supposed to. I have a prescription for it. Take it every day. Don't notice it. Marinol, again, was first approved in 1986 
for nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy, and then that was expanded in 1992 to increasing appetite for patients with AIDS wasting. People sometimes say that they get more zonked when they swallow a Marinol than when they smoke marijuana. They take the most psychoactive ingredient in marijuana, reproduce it in a, in a lab, some petrochemical analog, uh, throw it in a pill and tell a wrenching patient, here, this is marijuana, take this pill. A lot of people who are opposing smoking of marijuana say, well, gee, why do you want to use a whole herb and why do you want to smoke it? And I, I've become somewhat of a student of traditional Chinese medicine where many therapies are herbs. In the whole herb, the plant that's been identified for thousands of years as having medicinal value, there might be interplay between a number of different components of the plant. Not everyone agrees that advocating the use of marijuana is good medicine. Dr. David Smith, director of the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic, is one critic. Uh, medical marijuana contains a lot of baggage. It contains tars and nicotine. Uh, it's a crude plant. Uh, the use of marijuana as a medicinal goes counter to the whole thrust of modern uh, pharmaceutical research, which is to identify the therapeutically active property, isolate it, and use it in a, a therapeutic setting. In fact, some suspect that marijuana advocates have an ulterior motive to promote the legalization of marijuana in general. The advocates of marijuana legalization now saying, well, gee, all marijuana use is medicinal. Proposition 215 was voted on by the people of California in November of 1996, which allowed for uh, individuals to uh, possess or cultivate marijuana for medicinal purposes if it was approved by a physician and fit into a, a list of various diseases, including AIDS, cancer, glaucoma, multiple sclerosis, and then at the end, a big catchphrase or any other condition for which marijuana may have benefit. So I think many people were concerned that that was sort of opening all doors and basically leading to the uh, legalization of marijuana for recreational use. Despite all the controversy, Dennis Perone's medical marijuana programs have served thousands of people. Before the cannabis farm, there was the Cannabis Buyers Club, which was founded by Perone in 1992 and operated in the heart of San Francisco for four years. There's a club that I started for sick and dying people. It started out with a couple hundred people and then got to be 10,000 people. And we started out in a little place and then we moved into this five-story building right on Market Street. And we had an elevator, we had the Jerry Garcia elevator. And you go up to my club and you see things that you never saw before. You saw people, saw hundreds of people in wheelchairs. You saw black people and brown people and gay people all sitting at the same table, smoking a joint. You saw the bonds and the stereotypes breaking down. The medical marijuana movement has a uniquely gay history. Joining Dennis Perone in the battle for legalization was Mary Rathburn, also known as Brownie Mary an out lesbian who devoted her life to humanitarian causes. Between 1979 and 1996, Brownie Mary was arrested and imprisoned five times for distributing brownies made with marijuana to people with AIDS. I met her in the 70s at the cafe floor and someone said, hey, this old lady wants a hit of your joint. We were young at the time and I look over and she was about 50, 60 and I said, she wants a hit? I'm sure, give her a hit. And it really started a 20-year relationship. Brownie Mary just died this year. She used to wheel patients back and forth to x-ray, take their blood specimens to the lab, and also bring her kids, she called them brownies, that she made with marijuana. Brownie Mary just rolled up her sleeves and take, started taking care of these kids that were dying of AIDS. And uh, she, uh, in the end, just wound up calling all of them her sons, her kids. Dennis Perron started his crusade when his lover, Jonathan West, was dying of AIDS. I started the club in memory of Jonathan West to help all these young people who had AIDS. My friends were dying of AIDS. They were buying pot in the park. They were being threatened by the cops. Some of them were being robbed and stabbed. I had to do it. I had to save my friends. Hi, I'm Aidan Gillan, and uh, I play Stuart Allen Jones in Queer as Folk, which we're filming in Manchester at the moment, and you are watching In the Life. This past September, on Labor Day weekend, our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., was the host city for the 10th annual International Friendship Weekend. 
The International Friendship Weekend is a gathering of gay Asians and their friends from around the world. Members come together in workshops to share their experiences, as well as to socialize, network, and make new friends. Early in October, the National Latino, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Organization, or YAGO, held its seventh annual national convention in San Diego, California, followed by its second international conference in Tijuana, Mexico. The event was one of the largest political gatherings of queer Latinos, both in Mexico and in the U.S. Diego's mission is to organize Latino communities nationally and internationally to overcome social, health, and political barriers. San Diego activist Nicole Ramirez Murray outlined some of the ways that the queer Latino community can continue to empower itself. We must elect more Latinas and Latinos to public office, from school boards to the State House to Congress and to the White House. Also in October, President Clinton and New York Senator Chuck Schumer were guest speakers at the Empire State Pride Agenda's 8th Annual Fall Awards Dinner. The dinner raised more than $1 million, a record for a non-AIDS-related gay and lesbian event. Empire State Pride Agenda is New York's only statewide organization dedicated to maximizing the power of the gay and lesbian vote. As President Clinton noted, that vote has become a major force in today's politics. You deserve most of the credit, and you will get more as you fight harder, but also as you are human to people who do not see you. Still to come on In the Life. You don't know how happy I'm Publisher Sheila Alexander Reed, a trailblazer for Washington, D.C.'s black lesbian community. And a story of two couples having kids and creating families, including proud parent, writer Dan Savage. But first. Our next segment is from the In the Life archives, which first aired in June of 1998. In it, we profiled two United Methodist ministers who are working to make their parishes more open and welcoming to gays and lesbians. We begin our story in Nebraska, where the Reverend Jimmy Creech elicited outcries of hellfire and damnation when he performed a commitment ceremony between two women. First United Methodist Church in Omaha, Nebraska, it was here that the Reverend Jimmy Creech first drew national attention by breaking a rule. In uh, July of uh, 1997, I was asked to do a covenant ceremony for two women. I agreed to do so, and uh, then in September, did the covenant ceremony. A ceremony which, as of 1996, had been forbidden by the church's social principles, principles that are voted on every four years by the Methodist hierarchy. In 96, there was added to our social principles a prohibition of clergy celebrating, to use the language of the discipline, homosexual unions. And it was on the basis of that prohibition that charges were brought against me and I was taken to trial. A church trial with a bishop presiding and a jury made up of 13 clergy members. It was the first time a pastor was tried for conducting a same-sex union. In our church, the, uh, there is administrative law and there are social principles. And the principles are really guidelines. Uh, some people have wanted to treat them as if they are law, but they're, they're not and I conscientiously acted in conflict with them because I believe that the social principles are unjust and discriminatory in this particular case. Acting in conflict with the principle forced the jury to vote on whether Reverend Creech had disobeyed the order and discipline of the Methodist Church. The jury's response? Five voted no and eight voted yes. They needed nine to convict, so he was acquitted. Uh, what was, I think, significant about it is that I was not certainly the first ever to do a covenant ceremony. I have, pref I have celebrated more than a dozen covenant ceremonies uh, since 1990. But it's the first since the legislation was passed in 1996. And it was the first one that was made public. Performing a covenant ceremony in a church is tantamount to sanctioning the behavior. He is no good. 
he should be derobed and, and clear out of the Methodist system mm -hmm. and out of everyone's system as far as I'm concerned. On, this, on the issue of gays and lesbians in society or in the church, we are divided. Um, what I simply did was to, to, to take an action that caused people to address that division and decide whether they could still remain together while divided on this issue or whether they had to separate. There has been significant uh, disagreement within the congregation and withdrawal of members. Uh, we really are hurting uh, because of the loss. Yet the voices of dissent, however loud, have not overpowered the strong show of support that has also emerged. The day we arrived, Reverend Creech's supporters were showing their acceptance of diversity in the congregation. We're very much uh, in support of Jimmy Creech and his efforts to be inclusive, particularly with the gays and lesbians. His life, his very career was placed on the line and he stood up for uh, me as a gay guy. We've had a lot of great ministers, but I think he's been the greatest. I really do. Something special is happening here. This congregation is, is living out its faith in a very bold and courageous way to say that we are open to lesbians and gay men and bisexual transgender persons. There has been so much oppression and abuse of this part of our community that I believe the church cannot just quietly say, we welcome you. We must shout it out. As First United and the Reverend Jimmy Creech struggle through this period of transition, perhaps they can draw strength from another Methodist church that has been a strong and bold witness to diversity for 35 years. This is San Francisco. This is Cecil Williams. This is Glide Church. We're one of the most integrated churches in America, probably the most diverse church. So when you look at us, you look at diversity not, not only in sexuality or diversity not only in race, but diversity in, in ideology. So this is a, it's a strange place, but it's the church. It is Reverend Williams' interpretation of what a church is that has propelled Glide's vision. First of all, the church is the people, not the building. Secondly, the church, it seems to me, must have some sense of, of belonging, a sense of being with each other. No matter how difficult things may be, no matter whatever they have to face, they do it because the church must lead, always lead. That means that the church must take risks. Now, my brothers and my sisters. And with the support of his bishop, Those Reverend Williams has taken risks. During his tenure, Glide's congregation has grown from 40 to nearly 9,000 parishioners. It is one of the leading social service providers in California, and certainly a leading advocate on many social issues, including gay unions. We've had same-sex couples coming together in commitments or marriages or whatever you want to call them for some 34, 35 years here at Glide. No matter what their sexual orientation of the people who grow there, they grow there because they are considered human beings. It hurts very deeply for people to be disrespected, humiliated, and denigrated, to be put down. And that's what the church is doing. What it in fact says to homosexuals, you, you don't exist unless you get like us. And I don't understand why we're so frightened about people being gay. Or people, I guess, you know, the real thing was people also felt threatened and frightened by black folks coming into the fold. We have messed up too much, haven't we? Finally, more important than United Methodist policy to these two heterosexual ministers, are the teachings of Christ. You know, it's a main, it's strange thing about it. I don't see anything that Jesus did. At any given point did Jesus, Jesus, I'm saying, exclude anybody. So if I'm to be a pastor 
and if I'm to follow Jesus in that kind of example, then uh, I cannot uh, discriminate against anyone. I cannot tell anyone that because of who they are, God's love is not available to them. Perhaps the starkest example of the division of the Methodist Church over the issue of homosexuality is this. While Reverend Williams continues to attract members because of his vision, Reverend Jimmy Creech, for the same vision, was recently fired. The Reverend Jimmy Creech lost his position at that Nebraska church and has since moved to another parish in North Carolina where he continues to perform same-sex unions despite continued reprisals from church officials. Recent studies show that as many as 14 million children in the United States are being raised by gay men and lesbians. Next, we profile two couples who are part of this growing phenomenon, the gaby boom. Seattle residents Dan Savage and his partner Terry adopted their son DJ in 1998. Dan, who was a widely syndicated columnist, humorist, and author, recently wrote about their adoption experience in his book, The Kid, What Happened After My Boyfriend and I Decided to Go Get Pregnant. We decided to have a kid because I'm allergic to dogs. So we couldn't go the usual uh, sort of gay male offspring route. Um, when we met, I had been talking to some lesbian friends about co-parenting, about making a baby for a very long time. and. Uh, so kids were always on our radar from, from the start of the relationship. And then when that arrangement fell through with the lesbians, we just sort of very naturally progressed into adoption. We didn't really look at other options. Um, once we kind of learned about open adoption, it just seems, it seemed like the smart thing to do. Because we did an open adoption, there were things that, that we got to do that most adoptive couples don't get to do. We were at the hospital for the birth. We were with the baby when he was 10 minutes old. We were there when the um, birth mother gave him up. Probably the most difficult moment was when we actually had to um, sort of take DJ out of his birth mother's arms and put him in his, you know, child safety seat and walk out of the hospital room and down the hall and to our car with him right after he was born. Our birth mother has legally enforceable visitation rights four times a year. If we want to meet more than that, we can. If she wants to meet less than that, she doesn't have to come. But we have to be available four times a year to her. And that's not much of a sacrifice to make, considering what she's given us. Pam and Helen live in a suburb of Los Angeles and are the new parents of six-month-old Grace. When we first decided to get pregnant, the original plan was for Pam to carry the baby with my brother's donated sperm. Um, but for various reasons, uh, Pam's work schedule, my work schedule, the timing, um, we decided that it was not the best thing, so we explored other avenues. And then one day we woke up and said, well, we, you know, we really, really want to have a half Filipino, half Caucasian baby. And Pam looked at me and said, well, I know a really easy way for us to do that, and that would be for me to carry the child. We went to the California cryobank. Uh, and we searched a lot of different donors and looked at their profiles. Once we found a pool of, of guys that had a clean health history, we found a guy that was coloring very much like my dad's. He must be devilishly good looking because uh, the child is just, I mean, we think she's beautiful. Every month I'd call the cryobank, pick up the sperm, take it to the doctor's office, get inseminated, and. Uh, um, and see what happens. It, it was an amazing process psychologically because, uh, you know, here you, you, you grow up uh, thinking that if you come within a country mile of sperm, you're going to be pregnant. At least that's the impression my mother gave me for sure growing up. And now we're buying the stuff for $110 for a, a little tiny vial, and it's hard to get pregnant. Because they live in California, Pam is able to secure a second parent adoption, which will give her the same legal rights over Grace that Helen, her biological mother, now enjoys. However, laws on this issue vary widely from state to state. 
There are currently more than 20 states that do not permit this kind of adoption and three states that expressly prohibit it. They do the paperwork exactly as though Helen were giving up all her rights to the child, but they attach a rider that says, except the birth mother is not giving up parental rights. It's roughly the same amount of paperwork you'd need to do to close a transaction on a $100 million uh, commercial building. It's an unbelievable amount of paperwork. Though Dan and Terry had DJ baptized in a Catholic church, neither considers himself very religious. Pam and Helen, on the other hand, are both very active in their church and hope that their faith will guide them in raising grace. I think that faith has guided us through our decision to marry. It's guided us through our decision to have the baby. It's going to guide us on how to raise her and how to deal with the issues that she's going to need to deal with. Reverend Larry Keene is the senior minister of the Church of the Valley in Van Nuys, California. They came to me and asked me if I would like to share in the public uh, dedication of their daughter. and We were very excited about that. It's a ceremony where we're making a commitment um, to one another, to grace, uh, to our families, uh, and to God. When we talk about family, we're not just talking about heterosexual families, but that we have an opportunity to embrace not only homosexual couples, but the families that come from the love that homosexual couples have together. Both couples agree that a strong support system is vital for any household headed by gay men or lesbians, given the many myths that exist about gay parenting. I think the most common one is that, at the most basic level, is that children will be influenced by the gayness, that they'll be exposed to a sexuality that um, some people aren't comfortable with, um, and that they themselves will grow up to be gay. Virginia Casper is a developmental psychologist and educator. And that's the simplest one to um, dismantle because it's evident that most, if not, um, you know, 98% of gay and lesbian people were raised in straight families, and so it's clear that, that uh, we needn't think about that. I think all the data shows that children who are raised by gay and lesbian families have all the building blocks that any other child would have, plus there are some built-in potential positives, such as having to deal with being different, being able to express who they are and make an argument for themselves. We went into the whole process expecting to encounter uh, a homophobic judge, a homophobic social worker, and nowhere did we encounter it. And we quickly realized that the only people at these meetings at the agency who were feeling it that we were gay, who were noticing it or having a problem with it, was us. It's not for everybody. It doesn't just change some of your life. It changes every minute of every day. But it is such a wonderful experience. And just because we're gay people, we shouldn't miss that. It's so enriching. According to the Family Pride Coalition, there are more than 14 million children being raised by gay and lesbian parents in the United States. These children and their parents face unique challenges at home, at school, and in their communities. For a list of organizations that offer support, information, and resources for gay and lesbian families, visit In the Life's website at www.inthelifetv.org. I'm Susan Morbido, and you're watching In the Life. As the gay community continues to change and evolve, many people of color still sometimes struggle to have their own voices heard. In 1993, activist Sheila Reed started a newsletter in Washington, D.C. to fill the void of publications for and about lesbians of color. Existing magazines didn't quite uh, fill the need that we had. It wasn't the fact that they were ignoring black lesbians, but they were from a white male perspective. Similar to the Washington Post is from a white male perspective. It's just a reality. 
Today, that publication called Women in the Life is not only a nationally distributed magazine, but also an organization that actively works to create a community for African American lesbians. Black lesbians were sort of the stepchildren of the gay community. You have white gay male, white lesbian, black gay male, and at the bottom of the totem pole you have black lesbian. And we didn't have anything. We didn't have a magazine, we didn't have any clubs, we didn't have any outlets. And so it sort of it became a necessity once I saw how little we had. Yeah. I had been throwing parties with my brother for years at our parents' house whenever they went out of town. That's what we did as teenagers. So we were very familiar with how much liquor to buy for a party, where to set up the DJ, how much room you need for a dance floor, and how to market it. The key component to any Women in Life event is the women themselves. Typically, the woman's over 25, she's educated, she has some ambition, she has some drive, and she's interested in meeting other people like that. Sheila Alexander Reed is an account executive at Washington City Paper and brings those business skills to women in the life. Now, with 1,300 members, Sheila was able to hire her first paid staff person, Diana Kenlow. The, usually, the first quest question is, when's the next party? <laughs> we get that all the time. Women in the Life also brings people together oh, through poetry well. readings. Earrings, just a swing, swing. That's a very Hands small, bob, bob, small, minuscule high, part of what we do, but it's really, really important. The curve of your tongue, the most aesthetically pleasing thing since sun setting on beaches, the taste of summer solstice, I cannot believe. It's a, a women's space, not that men aren't welcome, but it's a, a space that's safe for women, which is very important. Um, here we do a lot of uh, dialogue about what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a woman of color. When you kiss me, When you kiss me, I become a language perfectly spoken. Uh, <laughs> women love it. The people who come, they come with a serious regularity. Writing has saved my life in a lot of ways because um, there are a lot of things that I express. I'm a pretty quiet person, so I don't express things openly, and it's the best way for me to express everything that I feel. As long as we have a space, as long as women life is in existence, I'm going to make sure that we always keep that poetry going. If we have to bring it over here to my house, we will do it. Because I think that we are, as a community, at risk of destroying ourselves. And I think that this is something that we have to do to preserve ourselves, just to, just to survive. Sheila is most proud of publishing Zora's Journal, the personal stories of lesbians of color with breast cancer. That project gave women in the life a purpose, just beyond entertaining. If you can get these people to read this, stop partying just for a minute to read something that could save your life, it becomes empowering. And that has been um, the most significant thing that I think as a person, not just women in the life, but as a person that I could ever do. And now that I've had a taste of that, I'm all over it. Sheila lives in Northwest Washington, sharing her home and her name with her partner of four years, Lois Alexander Reed. Okay, women in the life. At 39, she has no plans to slow oh, down. Yes, the magazine, which has been struggling okay. financially like every other lesbian publication in the country, okay. is taking yes. a dramatic no. turn to a be late. online. Right, bye -bye. If you think about it, there's nothing out there on a huge level of that type that is strictly lesbian only. Not just black lesbian, but lesbian only. And I think that that is a huge market. I get emails from people in Germany, Iraq, Iran, and they all want to know, can they get a subscription to the magazine? And of course, the answer is yes, but we could be doing so much more. I could put them in touch with some people in Idaho. You see what I mean? We'll set up chat rooms 
And so this is sort of the next level of Women in the Life, the magazine. And as, as black people become more and more familiar with the internet, we hope to not have to print the publication at all. Last spring, Sheila received an Uncommon Woman Award from the Legacy Foundation. People have asked me, are you an activist? And I've always shied away from those type of titles, but it's like I, I get this knowledge, I see what's wrong with the world, and I now am forced to speak out about it because no one else is doing that. So defining myself, as a person who's very driven, black woman who loves women, who's very driven. That's how I would define myself. From all of us at In The Life, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by Michael A. Leppin, the Gill Foundation, the Rainbow Foundation, the Adolf and Ruth Schnurmacher Foundation, the Mitchell Gold Company, in the hopes of eliminating all types of fear and prejudice, and the annual support of In the Life members like you.